Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga podcast. We are on the third chapter. This is our 18th episode. In the last episode, we saw how in India, material life and spiritual life lived side by side with a pact where while spiritual life imprinted its symbolism in the material life, imprinting the idea that the very purpose of life is spiritual liberation, it allowed this material life to continue in its conservative inertia. And this happened because India had lost the progressive mind, the third part. In the absence of the progressive mind, this became two compartments. And on one hand, it imprinted the spiritual purpose in the masses. On the other hand, it also preserved the society considering the context of India at that period of time, where there was Turkic and Islamic invasion happening, the colonization happening. In that context, the conservative society preserved through its rituals and symbols the very spiritual purpose of life. And isolated pockets of yogic schools preserved the yogic knowledge. This was a great, this was a great service or the great consequence of that. But however, it was not really a victory, it was a compromise. Now, as the yoga is reaching out to the wider world, in the very first chapter, Sri Aurobindo said, yoga has to rediscover her purpose and her right methods. Because what we have as yoga in India is coming from these pockets of preservation where the original knowledge was protected and given to small group of disciples. And now from there, it is spreading across the world through large movements. Now let's come back to the uh, last episode of this chapter. We are starting with the 25th paragraph of third chapter, Threefold Life. Please do keep these lines open with you so that we can travel together. We have to recognize once more that the individual exists not in himself alone, but in the collectivity. And that individual perfection and liberation are not the whole sense of God's intention in the world. So this we have already touched upon multiple times, he is reiterating and it's very important for us also to reiterate because it is through reiteration this begin to enter what exactly it means. We have to recognize once more that the individual exists not in himself alone but in the collectivity. Even though there is this ideal of individual liberation, we must understand individual doesn't exist in isolation, it's part of a collectivity. And the individual perfection and liberation are not the whole sense of God's intention in the world. So therefore, this individual liberation and perfection cannot be the whole sense. What to do with the collective? What is the purpose of the collective being? And what are the stages of its growth? What is its purpose? Why it is there? Is it to provide the necessary experience for the individual to recognize that my purpose is to liberate myself? Or is there a greater purpose to it. What is this collectivity and its role? The free use of our liberty includes also the liberation of others and of mankind. The perfect utility of our perfection is having realized in ourselves the divine symbol to reproduce multiply and ultimately universalize it in others. So here he is beginning to touch upon it. The free use of our liberty, our freedom, includes 
also the liberation of others. So one has to bring that liberation for others and of mankind. The perfect utility of our perfection is perfect utility of our perfection is having realized in ourselves the divine symbol. The first is to realize in ourselves the divine symbol. We human beings are symbols of a divine possibility. So realizing that and everything in the existence or forms are symbolic expressions of a divine reality behind. Having realized that, to reproduce, multiply and ultimately universalize it in others. That is our wider utility. So one is to realize it in ourselves. Other is to reproduce, multiply and ultimately universalize it in others. That is what is called upon to universalize the spiritual realization, not as an individual isolated experience, not even as within a small collective, but a universal realization on earth. This is where earth's collective transformation, earth's transformation, earth's consciousness shifting will be happening. So there is a universalization that is ahead of us as a possibility. Let me read that again. The free use of our liberty includes also the liberation of others and of mankind. The perfect utility of our perfection is having realized in ourselves the divine symbol to reproduce, multiply and ultimately universalize it in others. Therefore, from a concrete view of human life in its threefold potentialities, we come to the same conclusion that we had drawn from an observation of nature in her general workings and the three steps of her evolution. Remember, the previous chapter was called Three Steps of Nature. Current chapter is called Threefold Life. Now we understand the distinction between these two things. One is three steps of nature. Nature is ascending from bodily life to progressive mind to spiritual realization. That's an evolutionary ascent. In threefold life is our human life has these three movements happening and they must work together resolving their discords, then only this ascension into the higher level will be possible. And this is also the nature's aim. So both are showing the same direction. Threefold life can fulfill itself only when they come together. And this ascension can move forward only when these three come together. So therefore, from a concrete view of human life in its threefold potentialities, threefold potentialities. We come to the same conclusion that we had drawn from an observation of nature in her general workings and the three steps of her evolution. And we begin to perceive a complete aim for our synthesis of yoga. And that's the whole purpose of this book, The Synthesis of Yoga, so we are beginning to perceive a complete aim for the synthesis. Why should we synthesize yogic traditions? It is not to liberate individuals. It is part of the process. Liberation in individual perfection is part of the process. There is a vaster aim of the collective aim and a universalized aim, an evolutionary step in nature. As we And we begin to perceive a complete aim of our synthesis of yoga. The next paragraph. Spirit is the crown of universal existence. Matter is its base. Mind is the link between the two. 
So once we structurally understand these three layers, the crown is the spirit, matter is the base, mind is the link between the two. Picture is simple. There is progressive mind, there is bodily life, and spiritual life. And these three are to be held in a single vision. Spirit is that which is eternal. Mind and matter are its workings. Here again, we are recapturing that affirmation. Mind and matter are the workings of the spirit. From this perspective, spirit is that which is eternal and mind and matter are its workings. Sri perspective is that there is no separation between these three things. Both mind and matter. Remember, these are karana, karana, no, karana sharira's that is instrumental bodies, the sukshma deha, which is the manomaya kosha, and then there's pranamaya kosha, annamaya kosha together, stula sharira, working out in the bodily life. So all these workings are actually workings of the spirit. Spirit is that which is eternal. It is beyond mind and matter. It is eternal. And mind and matter are its workings. So there is no conflict between matter and spirit. No conflict between matter and mind. It is an artificial division and we must be aware of it. Spirit that which is concealed and has to be revealed. Spirit is that which is concealed and has to be revealed. Mind and body are the means by which it seeks to reveal itself. So there is a concealed spirit in the world that has to be revealed and that's the purpose of evolution. Spirit is that which is concealed and has to be revealed. Mind and body are the means by which it seeks to reveal itself and spirit itself is seeking to reveal itself through the mind and the body. That's why they are instruments. Karana Sariras the instrumental bodies, mind and body. Spirit is the image of the Lord of the Yoga. Mind and body are the means. He has provided for reproducing that image in phenomenal existence. Phenomenal existence is our worldly existence, the transient existence where birth, growth, maturity, decay, death, all forms go through the life cycle. It's very transient. It's, a, it's an orb. It's like the substance of the spirit through which the spirit is trying, is expressing itself. Spirit is the image of the Lord of Yoga. The Lord of the Yoga. Yogic process, all the yogic processes recognize the spiritual existence. And that spiritual existence is the master of yoga because it is that spiritual existence working through the mind and body to reveal itself. Therefore, we are recognizing and acknowledging the master of yoga. Spirit is the image of the Lord of the yoga. Mind and body are the means he has provided for reproducing that image in phenomenal existence. We can say all that in the phenomenal existence is an image. Yet, they are imperfect expressions. Imagine like an artist creating various art forms, but artist knows this is not yet expressing what I want to express. These are imperfect forms. Whether it is sculpting or painting any form, material medium is a means of expression. So spirit is expressing itself through the progressive mind and bodily life. To express the spirit in its full glory, to irradiate life with it, irradiate mind with it. So that's a work in progress, the evolutionary work. Spirit is the image of the Lord of the Yoga, 
mind and body are the means he has provided for reproducing that image in phenomenal existence. All nature is an attempt at a progressive revelation of the concealed truth, a more and more successful reproduction of the divine image. All nature is an attempt at a progressive revelation. Simple, straightforward statement. The spirit is to be revealed. All nature is an attempt at a progressive revelation of the concealed truth. T is capital here. There is the truth of the spirit that is to be revealed. It is currently concealed. A more and more successful reproduction of the divine image. Currently, we humans are getting reproduced in billions, but it is still an imperfect product getting mass produced. It's not a perfected product. The divine glory is still not revealed itself in the human mold. The progressive mind is able to express itself, but the spiritual reality is yet to find its expression through the human mold, the human image. All nature is an attempt at a progressive revelation of the concealed truth, a more and more successful reproduction of the divine image. But what nature aims at for the mass in a slow evolution, yoga effects for the individual by a rapid revolution. It's a revolutionary statement. If there is a revolution, this is that revolution. What nature aims at for the mass in a slow evolution? The human mass is evolving at a very, very slow rate. Nature's evolutionary process is slow. And this precisely is where yoga come in. Yoga effects for the individual by a rapid revolution. What nature does in the mass, yoga does for the individual through a rapid revolution. A revolution in which the entire past formations are dissolved and the caterpillar can become a butterfly. And that's the possibility yoga brings to the individual. And this is done by taking up the very powers of nature herself. And we are at a crucial junction of our human history where we need to upgrade ourselves. Our technologies are evolving so fast. AI is evolving so fast. Intelligence has become artificial intelligent and that is outpacing human intelligence. So who are we? How do we evolve rapidly? And what is the means of that evolution? Here it is. Yoga effects for the individual by a rapid revolution. It works by a quickening of all her energies, a sublimation of all her faculties. Her energies, her faculties. Nature's energies, nature's faculties. Yoga does this revolution by quickening, which we have touched upon already in the very first chapter. Yogic process takes up the yoga, whatever nature has already established within us. Nature's energies, whether it is mental energy, emotional energy, vital energy, physical energy. Yoga takes up these energies, quicken them, and sublimation of her faculties. Faculties, again, psychological faculties of our cognition, our empathy. All these capacities can be sublimated, intensified, and utilized for a rapid evolution of human nature. So it works by a quickening of all her energies, a sublimation of all her faculties. 
while she develops the spiritual life with difficulty and has constantly to fall back from it for the sake of her lower realizations, the sublimated force, the concentrated method of yoga, can attain directly and carry with it the perfection of the mind and even, if she will, the perfection of the body. So in nature, nature is already working and creating isolated prototypes of individuals who are awakening here and there. Historically, it has happened. While she develops the spiritual life with difficulty and has constantly to fall back from it for the sake of her lower realizations. So even when few individuals are liberated and a little wave rises up, it falls back. So this had been the case. And this is happening because of for the lower realization. This movement has to take along with that rising the progressive mind as well as the bodily life. For the sake of her lower realizations, the sublimated force, the concentrated method of yoga can attain directly and carry with it the perfection of the mind and even if she will, the perfection of the body. So the yoga takes up the nature's own force, nature's own aspiration to ascend, takes that up and that sublimated, concentrated force of yoga can actually perfect the mind, not only mind, if nature wills even the body, the divinization of the body too is a possibility Sri Aurobindo is pointing at. Nature seeks the divine in her own symbols. Yoga goes beyond nature to the Lord of nature, beyond universe to the transcendent and can return with transcendent light and power with the fiat of the omnipotent. Here is the game changer. Nature seeks the divine in her own symbols. She created us. We are symbolic representation. We are symbols of divine possibility, not yet divinized. Nature seeks the divine in her own symbols. Yoga goes beyond nature to the Lord of nature. That's where an individual can take the powers of nature, sublimate it, concentrate it, ascend to a divine reality. The Lord of nature is that divine reality, the divine being behind the existence of, of which nature is the creative force manifesting and nature is expressing through her evolutionary process that divine reality. And individually nature can ascend to that spiritual reality, know the Lord of nature who is beyond the universe and who is transcendent and can return with the transcendent light and power. That possibility to return into the bodily life, into nature's evolutionary journey down here. This is the game changer. One is ascending to the spiritual reality, other is returning with the light and power of that spiritual reality and the fiat of the omnipotent. Omnipotency is the power that is everywhere in existence. From the tiniest particle to the largest structures and the whole Existence, it is omnipotent. The spirit is omnipotent. And the fiat of the omnipotent. When the spiritual reality gives you the sanction, that's when you return with that fiat, with the light and power of that realization to take on the bodily life, the progressive mind, and shape them in the divine nature. Nature seeks the divine in her own symbols. Yoga goes beyond nature to the Lord of nature, beyond the universe 
to the transcendent and can return with the transcendent light and power with the fiat of the omnipotent. But their aim is one in the end. When an individual ascend, a yogi ascend to the spiritual reality and return to embrace the worldly life to transform it. This is not something that is separate from nature's own aim. Remember in the very beginning, Sri Aurobindo, the very first chapter, saying yoga is essentially fulfilling nature's own aim. So therefore, he's saying, but their aim is one in the end. The generalization of yoga in humanity must be the last victory of nature over her own delays and concealments. So this is the step that is ongoing. And it's not surprising that yoga has now an International Yoga Day. The generalization of yoga in humanity must be the last victory of nature over her own delays and concealments. It is nature's own victory. She had many delays and concealments because she had to work out more and more complex perfection. When mind is left behind, she has to come back and pick up the mind and elevate it. When the bodily life is left out, she has to come back and pick that up and then widen it to larger and larger groupings. So now, generalization of yoga in humanity must be the last victory of nature over her own delays and concealments. Even as now, by the progressive mind in science, she seeks to make all mankind fit for the full development of the mental life, so by yoga must she inevitably seek to make all mankind fit for the higher evolution, the second birth the spiritual existence. So here, on one hand, once one hand we see the science is preparing humanity, all mankind, with the possibility of the progressive mind. Even now, as by the progressive mind in science, she seeks to make all mankind fit for the full development of the mental life. What appears as science doing, it is she who is doing it. Nature is using the scientists and science and its technologies and is preparing all mankind fit for the full development of mental life. This is what is happening in today's world this rapid expansion of mentality, mentalization of everything, information age, explosion of knowledge, all that. Even now, we are able to harvest intelligence itself, rational intelligence itself, in the form of artificial intelligence. Therefore, knowledge production, innovation, all that will rapidly accelerate further and it will embrace the entire humanity. But this will be still development of the progressive mind and mental life in humanity. So by yoga must she inevitably seek to make all mankind fit for the higher evolution. So when the progressive mind is developing, the next step naturally emerges. That is the higher evolution. Yoga will bring that higher evolution. Yoga, by yoga, must she inevitably seek to make all mankind fit for the higher evolution, the second birth, the spiritual existence. So this is the next new birth, second birth that is possible. Here the word second birth he is also used in another context, triple birth. First birth is the material life. Second birth is the 
mental life into the progressive mind. Third birth is the spiritual life. Here he is just using the second birth, the context of from progressive mind to the spiritual life. The spiritual man is the second birth from the progressive mind. It's the next one. As the progressive mind in science, by the progressive mind in science, she seeks to make all mankind fit for the full development of the mental life. So by yoga must she inevitably seek to make all mankind fit for the higher evolution, the second birth, the spiritual existence. And as the mental life uses and perfects the material, so will the spiritual use and perfect the material and the mental existence as the instruments of a divine self-expression. So the progressive mind and mental life use and perfect, uses and perfects the material, the material life. In the similar way, the spiritual uses and perfects not only material, but also mental existence. Both needs to be perfected by this higher possibility as the instruments of a divine self-expression. The ages when it is accomplished are the legendary Satya or Krita Yugas, the ages of the truth manifested in the symbol of the great work done when nature in mankind, illumined, satisfied and blissful, rests in her culmination of her endeavor. Here he is pointing at the previous cycles in which such accomplishment may have happened. And in India, there is a term for it, Satya Yuga or Krita Yuga. Indian history, Indian notion of history is through Yugas. And four Yugas are there. The first Yuga is Satya Yuga, Yoga yuga of Truth. It's also called Krita. It's the period when it is accomplished. Krita means accomplished. The ages when that is accomplished. What is accomplished? That self-realization in a larger collective. Ages when that is accomplished are the legendary Satya or Krita Yugas. The ages of the truth manifested in the symbol. We are the symbols. So in which the divine truth is manifested of the great work done when the nature in mankind, illumined, satisfied and blissful, rests in, her, rests in the culmination of her endeavor. There is this long labor of nature in which in the past, she has accomplished in small groupings of humanity this Satya or Krita Yuga, where there was divine realization. And she, and such periods are referred to as Satya Yuga or Krita Yuga, ages of truth manifested in the symbol of the great work done when nature is in mankind, illumined, satisfied, blissful. Illumined. The light of the spirit is in her, satisfied and blissful, that self-existent delight is revealed and she rests in culmination of her endeavor and nature rests. It is for man to know her meaning, no longer misunderstanding, vilifying or misusing the universal mother and to aspire always by her mightiest means to her highest ideal. Now, it is up to us, we humans. It is for man to know her meaning. Her meaning. What is her endeavor? Only when we know her endeavor, we can collaborate with her. To know her meaning, no longer misunderstanding, vilifying or misusing the universal mother. Currently, we see the humanity misusing the universal mother, mother nature. And we can see the new generation are revolting against the misuse of mother nature. They are far more conscious about nature, preserving nature, protecting nature, animals, wildlife, all that. There is a growing awareness of ecology, deep ecology, ecosciences, and uh, sustainability. 
and care, increasing communion with nature, all that are positive signs and growing collaboration between scientists and yogins. It is for man to know her meaning, no longer misunderstanding, vilifying or misusing the universal mother. Vilifying, important word. Often, people look at nature as violent, very scary force to be conquered, controlled, mastered. This whole attitude of conquering nature or nature as a villain in our story with all her thunder and lightning and wildlife and destructive forces of earthquake and all that violent of storms and volcanoes, we can easily vilify nature. And the whole human attempt to conquer nature. So all these are tendencies in human nature and mis coming out of misunderstanding. So it is for man to know her meaning, no longer misunderstanding, vilifying or misusing the universal mother and to aspire always by her mightiest means to her highest ideal. So on one hand, we need to aspire for her own highest ideal, which is divine realization. For that, what are we using? Her mightiest means. The powers are also hers. It is using powers of nature. We can rapidly evolve and realize that highest idea. That's the promise. That is the work that is awaiting us. This is the possibility. This is what is unfolding right in front of us in what appears to be a tremendous chaotic transformation in the world. So with that, we are ending this chapter called Threefold Life, where we saw how these three possibilities, three potentialities need to come together, the bodily life, the progressive mind, and the spiritual life, all together, working together, taking up powers of nature, working towards nature's own aim, her own ideal, to express the divine in nature, through nature. That is the fulfillment towards which we are moving. A new Satya Yuga towards which we are moving. It is not yet Krita because it is not done. We are still moving towards it. And that is the promise, that is the significance of the crisis we are in the evolutionary crisis. Human beings are in an evolutionary crisis and yoga can play that critical role and yoga is utilizing the powers of nature to accelerate our own individual evolution, through that the collective evolution and to universalize the divine nature so that not only the mind is divinized but also the eventually body itself can be divinized if that is the intention nature has set for herself. And we are her thinkers, her instruments, and it's a great adventure ahead of us. With that, let's close this chapter. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Please do share your words of wisdom, words of insight. See you next week for the next chapter. Thank you.